Next on BYUSN, who or what will be the deciding factor for BYU football against Oregon tomorrow? Plus, Heisman Trophy winner Ty Detmer previews BYU and Oregon. It's vengeance for Ty and the 1990 BYU team in Eugene. Can't wait to be on the show today with you guys. Ty, wait until the B-Block will bring in next segment. Welcome to BYU Sports Nation, presented by the BYU Store Official Outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. It is Friday, September 16th, game day eve, baby, of a ranked matchup between BYU and Oregon. Much more coming up. On that, I am Jerem Jordan in Provo. He is Spencer Linton in Eugene outside of Autzen Stadium. How is Eugene this morning, Spence? It's beautiful. Pristine conditions, really, and we're hoping that these conditions last through tomorrow. I know there's a chance of rain, and BYU has been preparing for rain all week in Provo. Helps that it's been raining in Provo, but we're just hoping that it will be low 60s, overcast, no significant rainstorms, things like that. But it's beautiful. It is ideal fall football weather, and we hope it lasts through tomorrow. Pristine in Oregon is cloudy with no rain. I can speak from experience. <laughs> a lot of truth to that. A lot of truth to that. <laughs> okay, All right, Jerem. Uh, you know what? Why don't we go to? Yeah. What? Why don't we get to uh, what's coming up today? Starting with this, we mentioned Ty Detmer previewing the Cougars and Oregon in the top 25 matchup. Does he have any suggestions for BYU as the Cougars take on Autzen Stadium? And did? The field really gets sabotaged when fourth-ranked <laughs> BYU played in Autzen back in 1990. We're going to ask him about that. Plus, our game day guarantees the second-best hug of the week at BYU, of course, following Jaron Hall and Jake Oldroyd. Fantasy Football Friday is also on tap, and we've got some big names on the waiver wire, Jaron. But first, today's BYU Sports Nation headlines. Number 12, BYU plays number 25, Oregon. Tomorrow on Fox and BYU Radio, pregame 1.30 Eastern on BYU TV and BYU Radio. MGM has Oregon as three-and-a-half point favorite, over-under at 57-and-a-half. Here's Oregon coach Dan Lanning on QB1, Jaron Hall. One of the things about BYU's offense is they're over time they've been one of the most explosive offenses as far as getting the ball down the field, and distributing the ball down the field. They really stretch the field, right? And, uh, Hall does a great job of distributing the ball. He throws a good ball, um, understands their offense, but also has the ability to run. You know, so he presents some good challenges with his ability to scramble. But I'd say he's a quarterback that looks to throw it, right, and, and uh, keeps his eyes downfield. Cougars in the NFL got an early start to the weekend last night. Thursday Night Football on Amazon Prime featured Kyle Van Noy and Michael Davis. Van Noy specifically had two tackles and two pass deflections in the LA Chargers 27-24 loss to the Chiefs. Headliners this weekend include Taysom Hill and Daniel Sorensen hosting Tom Brady and the Buccaneers in New Orleans Sunday, 1 Eastern on Fox. Jamal Williams and the Lions play Dax Mill and the Washington Commanders. Fred Warner and the Niners look to lose to my Seahawks. And Tyler Algier and the Falcons play the Super Bowl champion L.A. Rams. BYU women's volleyball snaps a three-match losing streak with a big road yeah. win at Utah. The 15th-ranked Cougars win three sets to one, led by Aaron Livingston's career-high tying 20 kills. The Cougars host UVU tomorrow, 8 Eastern, on the BYU TV app. Number 25 women's soccer ties Utah State 1-1. Brecken Mozingo got the Cougars on the board in the 19th minute, her fifth straight game with the goal, by the way. Aggies equalized in the 83rd. BYU hosts Utah. Tomorrow night, 9 Eastern on BYU TV and the app. And how about this, Jerem? Former Cougar rugby player Jordan Mattias has made the 32-player USA World Cup roster. Congratulations to Jordan. That is big time. That's fantastic. And she's played internationally for a long time. The best women's rugby player from BYU that I've ever heard of. Congratulations to Jordan. Formerly Jordan uh, Gray, sister with Alexa Gray, a women's volleyball fan. Those two sisters... Unbelievable. All rise and shout. It's time for What's Trending. Spence, there are many factors going into this matchup tomorrow between BYU and Oregon. The Cougars' uh, first trip there since 1990, as we talked about. We're excited to talk to Ty Detmer coming up in the next segment. So, who or what will be the deciding factor in the game, in your opinion? You know, I feel like everybody's so concerned about what BYU's offense is going to be able to do if Puka Nakua and Gunnar Rami don't play again because now they're on the road. And so, so much of that attention has been pushed to, well, are those guys in? Can they play? And I get it. Like, BYU wants to have their full accoutrement of offensive weapons, but 
If Nakua and Romney don't play, Jerem, I'm not that concerned because I feel like the bigger difference will be on the defensive side of the ball. I feel like the key, the thing that will determine if BYU wins this game tomorrow is BYU's secondary and linebackers specifically against Oregon quarterback Bo Nix. And here's why. Bo Nix is not a guy that's going to overwhelm the defense typically. He's a career 60% completion uh, thrower. He's got 44 touchdowns, 18 interceptions between his time at Auburn and in Oregon. And I watched his highlights against Eastern Washington. I saw five touchdown passes. thought, wow, that is impressive. That's a nice bounce back performance for Bo Nix, even though it was against Eastern Washington still. To come back after the debacle against Georgia, do that's pretty good. But upon further review, he's got a bunch of athletes around him that he's just throwing quick little screen passes to to try and get on the edge. And those guys are doing the primary amount of the work. And so if BYU can contain the edges and can make Bo Nix have to throw the ball down the field and press a little bit, I feel like he's mistake prone, Jerem. I think it's the BYU secondary and the linebackers holding the edges, maintaining the leverage on the outside against the speed and athleticism of Oregon and forcing Bo Nix to press and try and force the ball down the field. I think that will play a huge role in tomorrow's game for BYU. Now, if they can do that, I say advantage BYU. Uh, again, he's not going to overwhelm you. He's, he's not some incredible arm and path. He's, he can, at times can be pretty efficient. And I know people are saying, he, he beat Alabama when he was at Auburn. No, Auburn beat Alabama. Bo Nix didn't beat Alabama. Auburn beat Alabama, okay? So let's throw that off the table. I just I feel like BYU's defense has a golden opportunity to put him in some really, really taxing and trying and tough positions to make him force the ball down the field. Uh, and, and if he has to do that, I feel like he's going to be mistake prone. So, Jerem, I am watching Bo Nix versus the BYU linebackers and the BYU secondary. As you pointed out earlier this week in an offline conversation with me, the longest pass play of the season for Oregon is 26 yards, and that includes a game against an FCS opponent. BYU, they love the idea that they don't give up big plays. If Oregon can't connect on big plays tomorrow, another advantage to BYU. What do you think? To your point, we hope Bo Nix becomes Bo Picks and that he throws interceptions to BYU. Also, Eastern Washington in that game. Oregon did not have a 20-yard completion in that game. Now, you could argue... Ah, it's EWU, it's FCS, you can run the ball, you don't need that. You don't have a single 20-yard throw down the field. I imagine they'll have a couple against BYU, as Baylor did. But there was nothing deep given up by that BYU secondary, to your point. I like that a lot. I think the BYU defense is ready for this, and so I'm saying turnovers. I think turnovers is the number one factor in deciding this game. What does BYU do extremely well? They don't cough it up. Just one giveaway uh, in... Two games, and it was Jaron Hall up 38, pressing the issue, thrown into the end zone. If the game's tied, I don't think he makes that throw. So I don't really care about that interception because of when and how it happened. BYU takes care of the ball. Jaron Hall has only thrown six picks from the start of last year to now. Are you kidding me? He takes care of the rock. Bo Nix, on the other hand, has thrown five in the last seven games. So I think BYU forces some turnovers. Doesn't mean that BYU won't give it away. I just think BYU will be even or positive in this game. And I think the Cougars come in much better than maybe we think. I think we think BYU's playing Nike. They're playing Oregon. Oregon is certainly talented, <laughs> fast, traditionally spread, and very good skill position players. They've got a very experienced offensive line. Everyone's back. BYU's a better team. Vegas thinks Oregon's favored because of location. But BYU is a better team who's way more experienced. I'm also banking on another factor that Jaron Hall will outplay Bo Nix, to your point. Jaron Hall is ready for this moment. He's going to hug the Oregon defense to the tune of some good numbers, efficiency, and, uh, and a win for BYU. I really feel confident, like last week, where BYU is going to walk in and play well. We felt good la uh, last week, Spence, reminding people that without Puka and Gunner, we still like the BYU receivers. And this is before that man, Chase Roberts, had the game of his life. Eight for 122 and one. We'll see if Puka and or Gunner can go. I'm not expecting either. If one of them play, great. If not, you got to feel confident that the BYU run game can do better uh, against a, a lesser defensive line, although that D-line's good. I just think Baylor's was better. And BYU's going to walk in there and be able to uh, control the tempo a bit with the run game. 
Is Oregon better than Baylor as a football team? Just straight, just ask I don't yourself think so. that question. I want everybody watching, listening to ask yourself that question. Is Oregon a better football team than Baylor? Certainly Oregon has a bigger facade and a yes. much bigger fan base and the, ties to the Nike swoosh. than Baylor. But are, are the Ducks better than the Baylor Bears? And I am gathering that most of you are saying, well, no. Like, Baylor's more physical. They're more put together. They're defending Big 12 champions. Like, they're back. Baylor's really good. So, why would we, as a BYU community, not look at this and think, BYU's got a great chance to win tomorrow's game against Oregon? Yes, I know that they're a three-and-a-half to four-point underdog. That's largely based on the fact that Oregon has won 29 consecutive non-conference games at Autzen Stadium. But I point out this, Jerem. What happened when BYU went into Madison, Wisconsin in 2018 with a much younger version of this team and offensive line and faced Wisconsin's 41-game non-conference home winning streak? Well, the Cougars snapped it. And what happened when BYU went into Nebraska in 2015? And Nebraska never loses season openers, especially not against lowly BYU in a non-conference showdown. BYU snapped it. This feels like a team of streak busters. They snap things, okay? This is the team largely that ended the nine-game losing streak to Utah. Why not have this BYU team be the team that in week three, they come to the Pacific Northwest as an underdog, and they look history in the face and say, forget you, it's time to rewrite our own history, and it's going to happen tomorrow. Why are we so afraid of the facade of Oregon football? I, I don't get it. I know it's a national brand, but when you look at Ones to ones, twos to twos on the depth chart. BYU matches up very well with this team. If they can contain the edges and make Bo Nix press a little bit, getting back to the original point, advantage BYU. And if Gunner, Romney, and Puka Nakua play, all the better. If not, I like BYU's chances because I think they are mature. I think they're ready for this. They've heard all week long about all the weird things that happened in week three. They're ready, Jerem. They're ready to play tomorrow. And if the defense shows up, and plays well, I like BYU's chances. Why wouldn't BYU win this game? To me, it's turnovers. If they just cough it up like they did against Boise State, certainly Oregon much better than that Boise State team. Uh, Oregon is good. I just think BYU is better and the, for all the reasons you just outlined. I also think the defense is going to show up again. This is a defense that through two games, South Florida and now Baylor, has not given up 300 yards in a game. Certainly Oregon is going to put up 300 yards, but I don't think Oregon puts up 400, Spence. And I think Oregon is sub-24 points in this game as well. I think BYU gets into the high 20s, low 30s, and that is enough to win, uh, uh, win this game. Uh, I'll, coming up in our guarantees, I'll tell you by how much. But uh, I believe in my in incredibly biased opinion that BYU is going to win this game. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, why not get to our game day guarantees, Jerem? And we've been pretty good through two weeks. I think overall percentage. You have. Well, I've been terrible. I say, I've been pretty good through two weeks. <laughs> okay. It's time, it's time for you to turn the page, right? Why not? Let you throw out the first two weeks. Let's get to the Oregon game day guarantees. Uh, and I, I'm on five for seven. Why not go ahead and, and keep that percentage rolling? So, uh, Jerem, I'm going to go with this. My first game day guarantee. BYU will have more passing yards than Oregon. On the road, at Autzen, yes, I know Oregon's offense is full of talent, absolutely loaded at the skill positions. I hear that from everybody I talk to. Oh, there's so much speed. They're so good. Then why didn't they BYU score a touchdown versus Georgia Oregon. then? They can't, they can't defend Oregon. Well, we'll see. I think this BYU defense is absolutely capable of defending the speed and loaded skill positions of Oregon. In fact, I think I guarantee BYU is going to have more passing yards in tomorrow's game than Oregon will have against BYU's defense. What do you have for your first guarantee? Bo Nix will throw a pick. In fact, he might throw two, but I'm going to say he throws one. As mentioned, he's thrown five in the last seven games. BYU is going to have a pick in this game. I'm going to join you on the Bo Nix train. I, I guarantee that Bo Nix will have at least one turnover. Now, whether that's a fumble, whether that's an interception, I feel like BYU's defense is going to get to him and is going to make him uncomfortable and, and make him try and make a hero play, something like that. And So I, I, I'm with you. I guarantee Bo Nix is going to have at least one turnover. Okay, my next one. Christopher Brooks will have a touchdown in this game. Uh, he has one receiving okay. touchdown, okay. no rushing in four career games against Oregon. And I watched that one with my own eyes Ooh. in 2019, as I mentioned. Okay, okay. Um, by the way, 
discovered this nugget. So Bill Musgrave is the opposing quarterback of tight end in 89 and 90, right? Those guys combined for like 900 passing yards in the 89 game. Well, Bill Musgrave was Christopher Brooks' OC at Cal the last two years. And uh, now Christopher <laughs> Brooks is at BYU playing against Oregon. How about that for full circle? That's pretty wild. Uh, the football community really is so small when, when you look at like just the guys that hang around and the community. That's pretty cool. Uh, I'm going to give you a third guarantee here, Jerem, and this is based on our good friend Greg Rebell. This is from his office, this stat uh, from his brilliant mind and from his research. Uh, the team leading at halftime will win this game tomorrow. Ooh, Whoever's that early. leading at halftime, I guarantee, is going to win this game tomorrow, and here's why. Because I think BYU is going to win, and I think BYU should be in the lead at halftime. Uh, if that's not the case, then it, it could get weird. H here's why. BYU and Kalani Satake is leading at halftime, 38-5 and five in the Kalani era. 38-5 and five when BYU was leading at halftime. Now, in comparison, when BYU was trailing at halftime, 8-23. and 23. Holy cow, what a swing number that is statistically. So I think BYU is going to have the lead at halftime. The team that is leading at halftime, I guarantee, is going to win this game tomorrow at Austin State. Let's just play 30 minutes. Um, you know, we'll just get, get the most bang for our buck that way. Uh, yeah, said no one. Okay, my final guarantee. Some people aren't going to like this. I think BYU wins this game by double figures. I, I don't think BYU just wins. Wow. I, I think they win by 10 plus. I think BYU establishes the run, wins the turnover battle, and now BYU is in the playoff conversation. Will BYU make the playoff? I don't believe that. Will they be in the running for a New Year's Six with one or zero losses? Absolutely. But again, this is a bad year for the New Year's Six at large, like we talked about. There's only one spot. BYU is going to win this by double figures. I'm feeling very confident about this. You know, Ooh. I like to call it as I see it, and I'm feeling great about this BYU football team and the opportunity in front of them. Granted, if BYU loses this game, Spence, and they only have one loss all year, this is the game to lose. Because you want to go into the postseason on this crazy hot streak. What you don't want to do is lose later in the year, lose the momentum into the top ten and up the, up the polls. So if BYU has to lose a game this year, and they probably do, this would be the one. But I feel like BYU is going to win this game by double figures. Okay, our question of the day. Who okay. or what will be the deciding factor tomorrow's game at Oregon? Jaron Hall, the defense, Chase Roberts, Christopher Brooks, other Let's hear from you in Voice of the Nation. BYGXII on Twitter. BYU defense, turnovers are going to be the golden ticket. And Uncle Joe is going to rise up out of bed suddenly and be able to walk, right? That was a crazy moment in uh, that movie. <laughs> Oregon is fast. I think our secondary is faster. Now, I'm not sure they're faster, but they can match them. I I'm confident in Caleb Hayes, the former Oregon State beaver going up against the Ducks. That guy's got some feelings, I'm sure. Um, D'Angelo Mandel, Gabe Judy Lally. You think Gabe Judy Lally's played in environments like this? Heck yeah. Like, every conference road game was like this for him in the SEC. And when you're Vanderbilt, every game probably is like that. I'm confident in the BYU secondary like I know you are as well. Yeah, I just feel like BYU's maturity is a thing, right? I, I feel like that they are Now it kicks in! Battle-tested. They've played enough <laughs> Power 5 competition in the last year and then now through three games this, this season. They're, they're, they're battle-tested. They're, they're ready. Oregon's not going to present to BYU's secondary and, and the defense in general anything that they haven't seen in the past year and a half. Like, it's not going to be like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if we can take on Oregon. We can't handle them. No, BYU secondary and linebackers and defense overall, they, they've seen a lot of this stuff. They'll be ready tomorrow. All right, Jerem, reminder to tune in Saturday for BYU Sports Nation game day live from Eugene. I'll be hanging out here. The guys back in Provo getting you set for everything you need to know between number 12 BYU and number 12, uh, 25 Oregon. Top 25 match review starts at 1.30 Eastern live on BYU TV. And coming up, Ty Detmer joins the program. What he experienced in 1989 and 90 versus the Ducks in Provo and Eugene. And what we're expecting tomorrow, this is BYU Sports Nation. Ty Detmer, the Heisman Trophy winner in 1990, 
on display. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. I'm Jerem Jordan and Provost Spencer Linton will join us in a few minutes from Eugene ahead of BYU and Oregon tomorrow with pregame coverage on BYU TV and BYU Radio at 1.30 Eastern time. Well, the Cougars played the Ducks back in 89 and 90. The most recent meeting was 06 in Vegas, but they had a two-game series that Ty Detmer played in. He now joins us live from uh, Arizona. And uh, great to have you back on the program, Ty, as we talk about BYU and Oregon. Some people said, hey, we don't want to talk about the 90 game, so we can just talk about 89 if you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd prefer to talk about that one myself. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, they were they were ready for us. A uh, little revenge factor. Um, you know, I didn't practice all week that that year. I had a hand injury, and so we kind of showed up, and we didn't play very well. So a lot of people accused them of wetting down the field and making the turf slippery and all that. But uh, bottom line, they were ready for us, and it wasn't uh, wasn't our finest hour that year. Let's talk about 90, and then we'll talk about 89, shall we, since you went there. Um, you walk in ranked fourth, 4-0, obviously the Miami win. A Washington State comeback that people forget, which is unbelievable, 36 points in, in that quarter which uh, for a long time was the most in a quarter until I think App State against North Carolina put up like 39 or something. It was crazy. You throw for 442, two touchdowns, five picks sacked five times. Why was 90 so different from 89 other than, as you mentioned, you had a hand injury, which is a big deal for a quarterback? Yeah, it, it, uh, you know, it was just kind of one of those things where we'd beat Miami, we'd come off of you know, a great comeback against Washington State, and then we just kind of fell flat a little bit in Eugene. But like I said, that, that was a tough stadium to play in. Um, you know, the crowd was really into it. Uh, we just, you know, we were outmatched that day emotionally. Um, they were ready to go, and uh, we just kind of came in and, and felt a little bit flat, but we just – didn't come in with our best day and and it showed so one of those games you talked about uh the alleged drenching the field before the game so did it happen or did it not ty (laughs) i don't think it did but you know we came in with different turf shoes on and you know kind of the flat bottoms and you really probably needed the nubs so you'd have to talk to the receivers and (laughs) dbs a little about that but uh i wasn't known for my burst so i probably didn't slip much i was more of a mutter anyway (laughs) (laughs) Okay, then we flash back to, uh, and in 90, you overcame that to win the Heisman. It's not like, oh, that didn't work out, you lost. <laughs> Nowadays, I think if, if that performance kind of happens, you maybe slip back a little bit. Great timing in 90, you took care of business there and obviously win it later when that's the only loss you have going in uh, to Hawaii. But we flash back to 1989. Uh, this is a game where you had to score 24 points in the fourth to win it. 470, three touchdowns. Bill Musgrave threw for 489. It, I've read that at the time that was the NCAA combined record. What do you uh, for passing yards from two quarterbacks? What do you remember about that one? Yeah, that was a shootout. Uh, they had a, a All American corner, um, and Odom, I believe, was his last name, and he was the guy that you know we had to kind of watch out for. And I think Jeff Franson ended up catching three or four TDs on the guy, and uh, you know it was it was a fun game because it was a you know a comeback at the end and. But they had good teams then, you know, they played good football. They were wide open with Bill Musgrave and, um, you know, they, they had athletes. So it wasn't really any different than it was nowadays. You know, they, they had guys that could run, could play, putting guys in the NFL. And, uh, you know, it was just, it was a fun day because we were able to come back and, and uh, have a comeback win that night. Jeff Franson, as you mentioned, 10 for 188 and three. Basically, that's what we call a Chase Roberts around these parts. That was a tremendous performance. What did you think, um, and before we get to Baylor, tell us about playing in Autzen. You mentioned the crowd, and they've been good for a long time. Certainly, they emerged in the 2000s even more with Chip Kelly and Marcus Mariota and the spread and the speed and the, the, zo- the zone read uh, running. What is it about Autzen and that crowd that makes it difficult to play in? Well, you know, they'll be ready for BYU after coming off the Baylor victory and ranked uh, high now uh, in the polls. They're going to they're gonna be ready. I remember, you know, when we showed up, they had all the tie-dyed shirts, and it was tie-dyed in Eugene. And <laughs> so uh, it was pretty clever, you know. But they're a great crowd. The student section, you know, gets into it. They love their football there, and, and they've been successful the last few years. So, uh, you know, I think you see what, what Georgia did to them, and that probably lit a fire under them maybe that they were thinking they were too good and, and uh, probably a wake-up call for them. So it ought to be a really good game. Um, 
I know they'll be ready for BYU and just the type of atmosphere they have there will be great atmosphere to play in. They're good. It's just how good because they played Georgia and Georgia's amazing. Like you mentioned, it's hard to it's hard to assess any opponent of Georgia at this point. And then they play Eastern Washington. They have 40 first downs, a program record. They score in the first nine drives. Those two uh, disparate uh, performances, it's hard to assess. As a, as a, a high school coach and former college coach, of course, how, how do you, would you assess a team, Ty, like that, where you don't have kind of this average game? You have kind of the, the low and the high there. Well, you take a little bit of the between for both. You know, uh, Georgia really just, I mean, they came out of the gate and jumped on them, physically beat them down. And uh, then Eastern Washington, you know, like I said, that was probably a wake-up call for Oregon, and we got to do better and a great week of practice. And all of a sudden, you know, they were the dominant team. And so you kind of – Take a little bit of both and, uh, you know, probably somewhere in the middle there, but probably closer to what you saw last week. So, um, you know, they'll have a lot of pride and, and with BYU being ranked higher than them, they'll they'll want to come out and have a great showing. And, you know, BYU is coming off an emotional win, double overtime against Baylor. So it, it's a little bit of that catch game, you know, kind of like we had in in 1990. Absolutely, and it, that was the first top 10 win at home since Miami, which is pretty crazy to think about. We revere that win as the greatest win in program history, and we hadn't had a win like that since until Saturday, which is crazy. We're talking to Ty Detmer on BYU Sports Nation. Ty, what would you think of BYU's performance against Baylor? Because there was a lot going into that game, given the Big 12, given the ranking, given uh, Baylor's performance against BYU last year, and the Cougars pulled it off. It was a minor miracle. <laughs> Well, I, I think it was a solid win for the program. Um, you know, Baylor's a, a great football team and so had chances to win it a little earlier and uh, didn't work out, but they hung in there, showed that that grit and that will to win and uh, came away with the, the W in double overtime. So it's a, it's a great way to start and, and a great victory at home. And now you got to back it up to, to prove, you know, that's a credible victory. So this will be a big game for them as well. BYU has a similar situation to what you had, not to the same degree, but that level uh, of beating Miami, beating Baylor, expectations. You're up high in the polls, BYU now 12. You're going to Eugene. It's a very similar situation to 90, right? What's your advice for a team like BYU that is very veteran, with COVID perhaps the most veteran of any BYU team ever, of ensuring that you walk out with the win and keep this thing going? Yeah, it's just keep grinding, you know, and, and I think the coaching staff does a great job of that is, is not putting too much weight into, into a win or a loss, you know, um, it's, it's keep grinding, keep getting better. You know, the, the preseason rankings are always tough. You never know where teams are from the year to year. Um, it's almost a little bit like high school, you know, you lose some guys and, and you hope some other guys step up and you never know until, uh, the bullets start flying in a live game. So, um, you know, this is one of those where we've got some guys that have stepped in last week uh, with Chase Roberts and a couple of those guys that still are hungry and a lot to prove. So that's got to be the mentality for the whole team. You know, we've still got a lot to prove and it's early in the year and nobody's accomplished anything at this point. You had interactions with Jaron Hall, uh, you know, when he was, I believe, on his mission in, in 16 and 17. And what's your, been your insight as a former quarterback watching this guy progress from he's waited his time to right now he's the most successful BYU quarterback ever against Power 5 teams? Yeah, I think he's everything everybody thought he would be. Um, you know, he was, he was committed to BYU when I was coaching there. And then, you know, when the coaching change happened, they kind of reassessed things and got to sit down with him. But I'd worked with him at some of our, our QB elite camps and things like that and really, really loved his demeanor, his – his mannerisms, uh, and then he can make every throw, and he's athletic enough to extend plays and and uh, beat you, you know, running the ball. Uh, so the, the guy's a, a great combination in the quarterback position of that poise and leadership and then uh, the athletic talent uh, to go with it. So he's having a great season to start with here, great year last year, and um, I know it's it's a lot easier that second year as a starter because you've kind of been through it. You understand what's expected, and he's showing that, that that's the case this year with a, a great win last week and now a chance to prove it again on the road this week. How have you seen him evolve over time from when you first met him to uh, what he's doing now? 
Well, he was real similar then. I mean, just a low key, you know, calm young man that, uh, you know, that had confidence, but not overly confident. So he was a great blend of of that type of attitude and so um he's just progressed and obviously matured as a family and and been on a mission so you know the maturity factor is obviously there uh but you know like i said i think he's everything we thought he would be uh coming out of high school have you ever hugged a kicker at the end of the game ty <laughs> of course yeah those, they're your best friends when they make a kick to win uh and then you got to put your arm around them when you lose and you yep. miss one too because you're going to need them later in the year so Absolutely. uh that was a great picture of him just you know being that leader and, and bringing it together and probably telling him hey we're going to need you at some point in the season so shake it off we, you know we all have our, our moments and so uh we're counting on you down the road you got a game tonight we do. We uh, we play South Mountain. We're two and zero. Moved up to five A this year. Uh, here in Arizona is a little different. They go based off success. So we're two and zero in five A, and got some uh, some tough games coming. So we're we're having a good time keeping Max Hall under control. We got old man Workman out here. He's coaching legend. He coaches track with us, and and he's around, always giving us grief. So he's a he's a big uh, fan of the show. So he's probably tuning in right now. So Very nice. Give I know you. I know you lost Dennis, and it's probably it was probably an upgrade for your staff. But Ty, best of luck tonight uh, with ALA against South Mountain. We appreciate the time, man. All right, appreciate it. Ty Detmer on BYU Sports Nation. Ah, oh, he's the best. Thanks, Ty, for joining us. And hopefully BYU can can uh, build off what they learned from uh, you know Ty and the team in 1990. Be ready and and go in and win this game. We'll see what happens tonight. And best of luck to ALA. Let's go. Okay, 25th ranked women's soccer host rival Utah coming up tomorrow night. 9 Eastern time on BYU TV and BYU Radio. Right now the BYU defense going through a little bit of a struggle trying to right the ship. they got a good challenge with Utah coming at home tomorrow night. Coming up, is a 3% chance to make the college football playoff enough to get us excited? We'll discuss. This is BYU Sports Nation on Game Day E. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. This is BYU Sports Nation to interact with the show and get great content throughout your day. Follow us on our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and the TikTok. He is Spencer from Eugene, Oregon, outside Austin Stadium, home of tomorrow's top 25 matchup on Fox and BYU Radio. I am Jeremy Jordan in Provo. Let's whip it. Good whip around is presented by Marisk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. ESPN's playoff predictor, Jerem, currently gives BYU a 2.7% chance to make the college football oh. playoff. What number does that percentage need to jump up to before you start to feel excited about BYU's chances? It's not about a percent chance of making it. It's about, well, if BYU's 7-0 after beating Baylor, Oregon, Notre Dame, and Arkansas, now I'm fully in. Up and until that point, no. Yeah, a number that seems to resonate with this audience and the community that we largely speak to is 10%, Jerem. So I'm going to go with 10%. We give a lot. Uh, once BYU gets to that number, yeah, sure. If BYU beats Oregon and then they handle their business against Utah State and Wyoming and they're 5-0 and going into the Las Vegas game against Notre Dame, then I imagine the number will be somewhere close to like 9 or 10%. And then I think BYU fans get really excited. So I'm going to go 10%. If BYU beats Oregon, they'll be 5-0, and and it's going to be close to that number. So beating Notre Dame and Arkansas would be a generous fast offering at that point? Is that what I'm to understand? Is Cosmo versus <laughs> Puddles the best possible college mascot matchup of the year? Uh, it's pretty much it's up there, my friend. The, the only reason it's that might not be number one is because it doesn't feature Big Red, the Western Kentucky University Hilltopper mascot, right? He's he's like, if it's not Cosmo, it's it's Big Red as the other greatest mascot. But Puddles is great. I love I love Puddles the Duck. Um, yeah, it's, it's a top three matchup all year. It's a fantastic mascot matchup. It's yeah, I I don't think it can be beaten. Uh, I I have some Great Northwest bias Ooh. here, but like Cosmo is the greatest all time. There's a massive gap. And then there's other great mascots that include Puddles, the duck. Yeah, I mean, look, think about like Brutus, who's the mascot for Ohio State, and then 
Notre Dame's mascot. Like seeing those two, like in they're week iconic, one, but that, they don't that do was anything. Pretty cool. Like that. To, ah, fair enough. Fair enough. What if do we're they talking do? Talking about like mascot performance. Yeah. Like Cosmo Goat for sure. Like so, I'm with you on that. We're going performance based. It's Cosmo and Puddles. All right, Jerem. Let's keep this thing rolling. As we turn our attention to BYU women's volleyball, the 15th ranked Cougars beat Utah last night. Huge road win. With that win, snapping the three match losing streak, has BYU officially righted the ship? I think they have. Those three teams were all in the top 10. One of those was at home, one was neutral, one was road. BYU has UVU tomorrow night, then they're into conference play, which, by the way, Pepperdine beat number six Minnesota uh, two nights ago. And Ooh. San Diego has two top 10 wins on the year. League play is going to be tough. You have four matches against teams that are pretty good. I think they've righted the ship, and now they're coming back home for uh, UVU and conference play. Yeah, if you get a road rivalry win like that and, and have to go into extra points and a couple of sets to do so, I, I feel like they're back. I feel like BYU is back on the women's volleyball front. So I'm with you. I think they've righted the ship. They got good mojo going into West Coast Conference play. Did you hear that? I think that was Joe Tessitore saying BYU women's volleyball is back. Crazy. After a tie with Utah State and a loss to Utah Valley, does BYU soccer need to salvage some Beehive State pride tomorrow against Utah? One million percent. BYU women's soccer absolutely has to have this win. Not a tie. They cannot settle for another tie. They have got to figure out a way to win this game so that they can rediscover what that winning feeling really is. I think they just forgot. Like this team has so much talent, but when you get in a funk and, and you forget like how to win games and close out games, things can get really weird. Things are weird right now. They just need to lock in a win, and if they can do it against longtime rival, all the better. Like, one million percent. They need this win to break out of the funk. Let's get weird. I think it's weird that the team watched Workaholics together because, yes, you're right. Defensively, it's been tough, giving up a bunch of goals. Just the one, but it was late last night. Utah has given up zero or one goals the last six games, longest streak in five years. So it'll be a battle uh, Saturday night, but a good one right here on BYU TV at 9 Eastern time. Yeah, they just got to close out a game. They have not been able to do that, close out the game. Uh, speaking of closing out games, Kansas City did so against the Los Angeles Chargers last night. Andy Reid and his Chiefs beating Kyle Van Noy and Michael Davis on the Chargers 27-24. After the game, Andy Reid was seen hugging Kyle Van Noy and whispering something in his ear. Jerem, what was it that Andy Reid said to Kyle Van Noy? He said, for Brigham. Or maybe he said, do you remember the 2012 point study ball? That was awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure he whispered in his ear, hey, do you think that Kalani would accept me on his staff at any point? Because I'd love to be an offensive analyst. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's what they were talking yeah, about. Yeah, they could pay him the sin. Yeah, There's yeah, always yeah. room for Andy Reid. There's, There's always room for Andy Reid to be an offensive analyst. BYU's pipe dream since 2001. <laughs> Although, that was legitimately a possibility at the time. But, yeah, that's that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> Great stuff, man. All right, uh, while BYU prepares to face Oregon tomorrow, you can get ready for game day by catching up on all of our extensive programming. There's a bunch of it. Watch every episode of BYU Sports Nation, Coordinator's Corner, After Further Review, and BYU Football with Kalani Satake, all on demand on the BYU TV app or at BYUSN.com. Yo, Chase Roberts coming up is available on the Fantasy Waiver Wire. Am I going to drop someone and pick them up, or am I keeping the same team? I'm down 0-2. Fantasy Friday is on deck. This is BYU Sports Nation. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Maersk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation live from Studio B in Austin Stadium in Eugene, Oregon on game day eve, baby. Ah, just a loner here in the studio. Spencer out there in Eugene. It's time for a Fantasy Football <laughs> Friday. Spence, what are the rules? Yes, let's recap those, Jerem. We each have seven current or former BYU players on our respective rosters. Each week we will pick three players from that seven-man roster to represent us in Fantasy Football for the weekend. Each week we can replace one player via the waiver wire. Whoever lost the prior week has the number one pick on the waiver wire, which means, Jerem, 
you have the waiver pick, but not before you remind everybody how the scoring works. At what point did you, we just walk into an NFL Films video, by the way. This is awesome. I love this song. Okay, both offensive and defensive players get points for yards, touchdowns, defensive players for tackles, tackles for loss, sacks, takeaways, so on and so forth. Okay, so you are up 2-0. You won last week, so I get the first waiver wire pick, and I drop Tyler Algier, and I pick up Ooh. Chase Roberts. That is my yeah, waiver wire pick. Yeah, not Yep. Uh, it's it's a needed waiver wire pickup. I get that this is the right move that you were Thank making. Thank you for that. Now there's still another big name, still another big name on the board, Jerem. And I'm picking him up with my waiver wire pick. I am dropping Isaac Rex because BYU hasn't chosen to use the tight end a bunch this year. I'm dropping Isaac Rex, and I'm picking up Mad Max Tooley and adding nice. him to my roster. Now it's just a question of, like, do I go the waiver wire and put him in the starting lineup? Well, yeah. we'll find out in just a moment. Okay, here are my week three starters. i got to get back in the game here. you got Jaron and Fred. That's hard to deal with for me. I am playing Chris. You gotta get Brooks. Zach Wilson healthy, man. Exactly. I am playing Ben Bywater. And I am playing Lopini Katoa. I need rushing touchdowns. Or receiving. But I am investing in the running okay. backs. Give me something this week! Let's go! You're go you're going with the two running back approach. Yep. Okay, okay. Now here are my starters for week three as I look to go up 3-0 on the season. Number one, Jaron Hall. He's been my big point producer. He's, that's why he was the number one pick in the fantasy football draft. I'm starting Jaron Hall. I'm going with Taysom Hill in the Saints showdown against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and Tom Brady. Taysom Hill is in my starting lineup. And my third selection for this week's Fantasy Football Friday segment is Max Tooley. He goes from waiver wire pickup into a starting slot. Wow. Max Tooley is going to give Oregon some problems tomorrow on offense. Bo Nix specifically, watch out for Mad Max Tooley. This segment has been dripping in intensity that it has lacked yes. from yes. a single song. Yes, yes. Well done, production team. Please I am high. remember this song. Bring it back every week. <laughs> Bring back this song every week for fantasy football. I love it. Best. Oh my goodness. And okay. that's live music. I, know, just, I just want to play football right now. They're just in the other room, just doing their thing. Uh, I love it. Okay, <laughs> fantasy football has been a fun addition to uh, BYU Sports Nation this year. Again, get Zach Wilson healthy, and then I think I'm things get Zach. very interesting once you can start a quarterback regularly. Yes, yes. All right, Jerem, uh, as we wrap up this segment, <clears throat> Uh, I do need to remind everyone, and I'm looking for what I'm supposed to be saying here because my phone just went. I okay, got you. Back. Oh. Hey, 15th ranked BYU women's volleyball hosting Utah Valley University <laughs> tomorrow. Watch the match 8 Eastern on BYU TV. You're like, sports, Good grief, sports are on the app uh, tomorrow at some point with somebody. Tech technology. I love it, but not as much oh my goodness. as you see. What is your deciding factor in tomorrow's <laughs> game, and who's getting that elite voice of the day? This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. BYU Sports Nation is on demand. Download well the BYU TV and BYU Radio <laughs> applications today. Download the podcast on our favorite podcast platform, and please subscribe, rate, and review. BYU does have a duck pond. We just showed it. That's well played. Puddles uh, kids just hanging out there. Our question of the day, who or what will be the deciding factor in tomorrow's <laughs> game at Oregon? Cosmo D. Cougar on Twitter. I hate to hope that it's this close, but I'm hoping that it's Jake Oldroyd going four for four and drilling one of those 50-plus uh, yarders. I believe Jake Oldroyd is going to play a massive factor in BYU's success the rest of the season. The hope is that he is good to go and, and ready to go because he is certainly more than a capable kicker. Went through an emotional situation, obviously, with missing two would-be game winners. And so hopefully he's good to go because BYU needs him. Yeah, certainly. He needs to see a kick go through the uprights. I don't even care if it's an extra point. Just something. Yeah, he needs sure. to see something positive happen. And once that happens... He'll kind of snap out of it. So, I'm, I, look, I'm big on Jake. He is a very, very exceptional and experienced kicker. 
We all have awful days. We all have moments where we get the yips. If you play golf, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You can hit 10 amazing shots in a row. Then if something bad happens, you, you lose it. Like you just get the yips. Like everybody deals with this and it's totally okay. Once you see one go through the uprights, which I think Jake will do in an extra point early tomorrow in the game, he'll be just fine. Let's hit this topic before uh, we end the show with about five minutes to go. BYU's coming off an emotional, physical game against Baylor. Certainly, BYU rebounded last year after the Utah game against Arizona State. Spencer, how are you feeling about BYU's ability to do it again in 2022? Yeah, BYU's certainly a little more banged up because of, of what happened against Baylor last week. And so, I know Tyler Batty didn't play in the second half, and he remains very questionable to play tomorrow. He's dealing with something on his hip, and, and oh no, Earl Tuyoti Mariner is potentially questionable. Like, so there are some guys on the defensive front that got understandably beat up against Baylor's very physical style of play. But other than that, like, I, I feel like BYU's defense overall is pretty healthy, Jerem. And, and Oregon's not a team that we think is going to overpower BYU like Baylor did or attempted to do anyway. And so I think BYU, they've got the depth, they've got the players, they've got enough people on the defensive line that they can handle that even if a couple of those guys do not play tomorrow. Um, the thing that was more concerning for me was like the emotional letdown, like, oh, man, is, is there going to be a hangover? I just don't buy it. I mean, we've been talking to the players and the coaches all week, like, how do you overcome the emotional hangover? And, and promptly the message has been, what hangover? Like, we're going to play Oregon on the road. Like, it was great. Malik Moore told me, like, we celebrated that night, then at like 3 o'clock in the morning and all of my group messages, it was like, all right, it's Oregon week. Go to bed. We got stuff to do. Like, I'm buying in on the experience that these guys are bringing. So, yeah, physical toll for sure. There are a few injuries, yes. BYU has another opportunity to prove that their depth is real, Jeremy, and I think that they will, they will do that. They'll go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Oregon tomorrow, physicality, speed-wise, and it's going to be a good football game. And I think the offensive line is probably ticked about that performance to some degree in terms of uh, the run game. I think Christopher Brooks and Lapini Katoa and that Blake Freeland and the boys are like, hey, we got to establish the run here. Let's make this a little easier. I think they will, and that's why I believe BYU win by double figures. BYU tracker on Instagram. Got to be the run game for the one factor that uh, determines the game. Oregon had to be keyed in on Chase Roberts at this point, so other receivers are going to have to step up, and a running game has to keep the Ducks' defense honest. Expect a little more Keanu Hill, perhaps. A little, little Cody Epps, Braden Cosper, Isaac Rex, Dallin Holker. Chase Roberts owned the day for sure, but there are a lot of weapons here if Puka and Gunner are out again, which at this point, I don't know about you, it's like, just let me know when they play, and then we'll go from there because BYU has some certainly big games down the road that they'll need them for, too. Sure. And speaking of Chase Roberts, are you sure you don't want to start him on your fantasy football team? I'm, 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 just, I mean, I'm if, running. If Puka's not going to play, it, you're, it's, you're running. This is you a run like game. the offensive line's going to bring it. This is a run game, and I need touchdowns for sure. Uh, if, if Chase is good but doesn't okay. have a touchdown, that hurts me. I need touchdowns. <laughs> also, I'm down 2-0. I'm getting to mildly extreme situations here, okay? I got I to gotta think creatively. <laughs> Our Elite Voice of the Day is presented by PAX Healthcare Elevated at Logan underscore, underscore Sackley. Hopefully, uh, Logan was a defensive lineman. That would have been the perfect name. Curious how early we see Jacob Conover. Early, certainly by the fourth quarter, maybe even the mid-third. Cougs by 30? What? <laughs> that's the elite voice of the day? Blue goggle alert. Oh, boy. Blue goggle alert. Wow. Okay, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's like tattoo-level uh, blue goggles. Wow. Jeez. Okay, wow. today's rising yeah, shout-out. Yeah. Presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. Cougar stats coming in from the top rung. Today's the 50th anniversary of Lavelle Edwards' first game and win as BYU's head coach 50 years after BYU began playing football in 1922. How about that? 50 and 50. BYU defeated Kansas State 32 to 9. I hope BYU beats Kansas State by the same score next year. What do you think of that? How about that today? No, I love that. Kalani's got 50 wins on his resume. We're celebrating 50 years to the day of Lavelle's first win. 50 is the number. Maybe it's a 50 spot tomorrow for BYU now, and Eugene, Jim. Now, now, now. That would be incredible okay let's not get let's not get crazy and i'm the crazy one here typically let's not get crazy but it's su it's just such a massive opportunity tomorrow again the final ride of independence you have these amazing games hopefully oregon's a big 12 member in the future probably not but that would be fun huge game tomorrow in an amazing stadium our thanks to today's guest ty detmer 
Conversation continues 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook+. Plus. You can get all of your BYU sports content at BYUSN.com. Sorry to Dennis, we ran out of time. For Spencer, I'm Jerem. Shout out to Jeff Branson, who just ate up Oregon back in uh, 89. See you tomorrow for pregame coverage on BYU TV and BYU Radio at 1.30 Eastern time. Go Cougs! Beat the Ducks!